Good afternoon. Good, great afternoon. Okay, first of all, congratulations. Because you of all of the people that I've interviewed thus far, you, you stepped fully into the deal of the century, didn't you? I don't know what the deal of the century you're referring to. We've had uh, I've, we've had over you know a hundred plans uh, thus far the Lawn and Rogers and Clinton plans. We have seen a lot of plans over the years in Israel. I'm very glad that the principle that I talked about of an uh, uh, an agreement with the Palestinians it will not be it cannot be based on territories for peace, but rather an exchange of territories, an exchange of population. And that is the narrative that we see in the Trump plan. Did you know it would be part of the plan? I don't know. Look, I talked about it a great deal with Greenblatt when I was defense minister, and I explained to him why it was important. And I told him it cannot be that the, the guiding principle, uh, that, the, uh, that, uh, that there be a homogeneous Palestinian state be established with not a single Jew, but will become a, a, a bi-ethnic bi bi state with almost 50% a, a Palestinian minority. No, 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 that's uh, not possible. And I'm glad that, that uh, this logic has uh, followed, been followed through. And uh, also President Trump added another uh, uh, point that he demonstrated that he's a true friend to Israel because this plan takes into consideration all of the Israeli interests uh, more than all all of the previous outlines. Have you read the entire plan? No, I uh, only scanned it. I'm uh, admitting it. I'm not uh, as uh, uh, talented as the other uh, Knesset uh, members that have managed to read it through. And I mean, they managed to have their own opinions on it before even reading through it. So they're really remarkably talented. But I hope that this weekend I'll have a moment uh, uh, after the work week to really sit down quietly and read the fine print as well. But I'm sure that people don't really understand the full significance of the plan. So, uh, for example, when we talk about conceding the neighborhoods in East Jerusalem, well, first of all, that's Israeli sovereign territory, and there is a, a, there's a law of unified Jerusalem, that meaning any concession on of sovereign Israeli territories would require a, um, a public poll. Also, because it's within the Jerusalem jurisdiction, you would need 80 Knesset members and a majority vote to agree. So there are lots of technical issues, technical and legal issues that have to be ironed out. Every little comma and dot is very important. So it's very hard to have a sort of a very clear, you know, opinion about the plan without reading it through properly. Could it be that the territorial and population exchange, which you're famously known for, is that been added so that you would uh, support the plan? Meaning that once the Americans accepted it, I have no, look, I don't, I don't have any prejudices, okay? I don't know. Um, what's important is that for the first time there is a vision. Nobody's, you know, uh, y y nobody's uh, living in a land of illusions, thinking that tomorrow we're going to sign a peace agreement with the Palestinians. One has to understand that the Palestinians are not very important in that sense. It doesn't matter what you propose to them. You can't propose to the Palestinians more than Ehud Olmert did in Annapolis. I remember that negotiations, everything that they asked for. You can't give more concessions. Olmert was willing to give it all away and also opened up the clause of the refugees. And despite that, there was no peace agreement with Abu Mazen. They didn't sign it. Before that, Ehud Barak, Prime Minister Barak with Arafat in Camp David, same story. So one has to understand that a real partner to a peace agreement, uh, not the Palestinians, but rather the moderate Arab states. I, at the time, by the way, uh, uh, published about this, uh, I published a proposal about a regional peace arrangement because you can't unilaterally with the Palestinians come to any final resolution to the conflict. That's not going to happen. You can only resolve the conflict with the Palestinians through an overall comprehensive plan. Okay, but I wanted to ask you about the territorial and population exchange because we're talking about a transfer, a consensual... No, uh, wait, 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 let me just ask the question, sir. It's true that no one's going to agree to this. People within the triangle certainly don't want to be Palestinian citizens. So what's the point of this clause, in your opinion? First of all, look, there's a real confusion of terminology. 
there's a big difference between territorial exchange and population exchange and a transfer. A transfer is which you uproot somebody from their house and throw them out thousands of kilometers away. No, 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 no. Here you're moving the borders. They're staying in the same house with the same possessions. It's all the same. Now, when I was a foreign uh, minister, I gave this to the international, to the uh, Department of International Law within the Foreign Ministry, so that we can get uh, uh, professional uh, reviews uh, on prof on international law. In terms of international law, there's no problem. There's uh, dozens, more than dozens of pre uh, legal presidents. Uh, so there's no legal problem in terms of international law. There is a committee that can be uh, consulted in the Israeli foreign uh, ministry. Uh, it's, still, it's still there, so there's no problem in that sense. But when you do a, a, a exchange of people and land, you don't talk individually with each uh, citizen. There are two sides and representative to each side, and they come to an agreement. In regards to the residents, to the uh, citizens of Umel Fahim, it's true, you can't hold the stick on both ends, people. You can't, on the one hand, have uh, uh, terrorists and terrorist bombers uh, going from uh, uh, that are being born and raised in Umm al and then going to uh, blow up uh, uh, the Temple Mount and uh, protest and then and uh, be pro-Palestinian and they also be uh, citizens of the State of Israel. So, they, what do you mean we should just decide unilaterally whether they're Israelis or not? Look, it's not that way. There are tools and, and methods uh, that are accepted in terms of international law. In terms of international law, there is no problem. But what is more of concern, in my opinion, because that's easy. Within 34 days prior to elections, nobody expects really for this to happen. This is not a fast food you know, conveyor belt. This is a vision, the plan. It's a good plan. It's implementation. It will probably take a very long time. But the fact that there is a vision that takes into consideration all of the Israeli entrants, that's very important. What concerns me is uh, the uh, uh, sentiment among the Arabs of Israel, some of which is uh, the blame of the state of Israel itself. Because if you look at what's happening in the younger generation of Arabs, it's very worrisome. And I think, th and I don't think anybody in this rule know, uh, room knows the statistics. But every year, 310 new teachers who are graduates of universities uh, from Judea and Samaria and the uh, Palestinian territories, 310 new teachers every year uh, that are uh, that are graduates of uh, Bethlehem coll College and uh, the college in Hebron. So, so. Uh, so a third of uh, the Arab teachers in the Arab uh, uh, school system don't go through any kind of training in the Israeli education system. And now we're, surprising, we're surprised that uh, the children of uh, the Birzet school are uh, showing extremist tendencies. Uh, just one more point, please, if I may. There is what's called the pedagogical guideline document for Druze and Arab schools. I don't know why don't we have a pedagogical, a pedagogical department for Christians, and why don't we have another pedagogical uh, um, department for Muslims? Uh, they want to be part of the country as well. I mean, why do we have to divide between Arabs and the rest of everybody? Uh, we would at least demand in the next uh, government to truly establish, on the one hand, a division for the uh, pedagogy for Christians and then stop them, same uh, uh, trainer, uh, teachers who've been trained in, uh, uh, in, in foreign colleges uh, to be able to teach in Israel without going through some kind of accreditation in Israel. But you called the Prime Minister, even prior to the elections, you called on him to uh, push forward with annexation. Uh, you said that the Americans are not really thrilled. Do you think that we should do this even though the administration at the moment is pulling up a lot of red lights? Look, the Prime Minister can't uh, just he cannot constantly, you know, be engaged in spins and to try and make a profit at the expense of the people living in the Jordan Valley. We submitted a bill a few weeks ago to implement Israeli sovereignty over the Jordan Valley because that's the maximal consensus in Israeli society. 
from the Alon program all the way to Rabin and Gandhi. And there's no reason why we shouldn't implement Israeli so impose Israeli sovereignty. And I think the Prime Minister has a massive majority in the Knesset for doing that. But as he always do, he will uh, run away. He's only using it for campaign purposes. And unfortunately, not everything is part of a campaign. You probably know that Begin when he wanted. In contrast to everyone's opinion, he passed the Golan Heights law in three readings over one day so if the prime minister wants to he could have a majority so he needs to do that even if uh, the american administration tells him to wait he needs to understand that there are things that are beyond campaigns and uh, let's move on to another question you know all of us watched perhaps most of the people who were here did not watch this but most israelis watched these images of uh, namai safar boarding the prime minister's plane and everybody's happy that she's returning and you know this is something that preoccupied israel quite a lot over recent months tell us please what exactly happened here look it doesn't really matter what happened first of all we need to congratulate for the fact that she's returning to israel and everything that has to do with bringing back Israeli citizens uh, from all kinds of places. It's always preferable to uh, keep a low profile and not to rush and take the credit because that could be harmful in the next case. And unfortunately, there will be additional uh, situations. I was involved in many cases that we managed to bring the person back. I never, you know, ran to tell. So let's uh, stick to that line. Israel gave some significant significant gestures. They say that it's not a deal, only gestures to Putin. Do you think that the price that was paid in order to please or appease Putin for him to agree to a release Nama, was that an okay price? Would you be willing to pay that? First of all, I don't know exactly what exactly they gave him. And also, like I told you, I prefer on these topics not to discuss them in public. Uh, will this be Netanyahu's elections image? You know, that picture of her returning on the airplane with him. Look, with all due respect to President Trump and President Putin, this does not solve their problems, which are on that are pressing problems on uh, the agenda here in Israel. Let's start discussing the problems. You know, for example, the Iranian challenges. We've seen uh, certain parts of uh, the Intel Directorate's annual report less than two years, according to that report. In less than two years, Iran will become a nuclear superpower. This is a problem that one cannot sweep beneath the carpet. We need to address this. I call upon, I guess he gave a briefing to the economic press uh, the governor of the bank of israel is talking in very dire terms about the deficit and you know things everything that's derived from that now let's look and here there's euphoria in jerusalem but look at what's happening in the south every day we have these balloons with explosives and only yesterday we there was yet another uh, re siren and we need to understand that the current policy means succumbing to terrorism and if we continue with this surrender to ten terrorism in two more years Hamas will become a threat just as big as Hezbollah so that's exactly my question with all these threats when we see the Prime Minister you know uh, hopping around from a ceremony in uh, Washington and then to the Kremlin to bring Namais Eschalbach do you think that he's really concerned with Israel's vital interest in this period or is he focused on his campaign no he Netanyahu is is the best campaigner, not just in Israel. I believe that he's the best campaigner in the world. He's an excellent presenter. Is she a victim of politics, Namai Sahar? Currently, he's only focused on the campaign and on nothing else. And unfortunately, these, uh, the, even the flashiest ceremonies the most glamorous ceremonies cannot s resolve the problems that we are dealing with. So it's really nice to, you know, use this uh, situation with Trump, but it won't help solve our deficit or all the problems of our collapsing healthcare system. I think that the most topical problem is right now, it doesn't seem that uh, there is a solution to the political entanglement. And after the elections, we'll also find ourselves in the situation that you, sir, will be the one preventing uh, a fourth pre elections campaign. Look, you promised that we won't go for a fourth round. Look, I promised last time that I will only join 
a national unity government. Both Gantz and Netanyahu dragged this country to unnecessary elections only because of their ego, ego because the two parties together did obtain 65 mandates. Theoretically, they didn't need anyone. What was the argument about? The argument was about who will be first, who will be second, and when will the rotation take place? And I said, if you have 65, you have the bonus of additional eight mandates from Israel Beitenu. But they prefer to drag this country to a third elections. And what will be different next time? Next time, it will be different. And here, I hope that everything is recorded and that you have a good memory. We won't go for a fourth elections. How? I've heard you say that. So I'm trying to understand what is Avigdor Liber Lieberman's outline for preventing fourth elections. Look at me, and I can tell you we won't have a fourth elections. OK, I accept the fact that uh, Netanyahu and Gantz fought about who will be first. But to the same extent, you could, or you still can, after the next elections, if we find ourselves in the same situation you could choose sides, either return to the coalition. Look, I chose a side a long time ago. We are going to form a national liberal and Zionist government. I want a Zionist and liberal government, period. How will we achieve that? Leave it up to me. Otherwise, you will uh, won't invite me again to another interview. So you are no longer demanding a national unity government. Look, regarding national unity government, regretfully, Netanyahu is saying, I won't enter any government without Shas, without Yehadut HaTorah. I think uh, he's making a mistake, a serious mistake here. And uh, that's why we actually need to. And by the way, I'm also also concerned if there's one thing that concerns me, that's uh, the collaboration between the anti-Zionist party, the uh, joint party, and non-Zionist parties like Shas and Yaduta Torah. What's happening in the finance committee is a midday ro robbery in midday light. You know, these three parties uh, through collaboration and coordination, uh, they are doing whatever they want. Look, if we go back to this argument of the national unity government, who will serve first? Now that uh, Netanyahu's immunity is no longer on the table and uh, the trial will begin, do you think that he can continue to serve as prime minister while he's, uh, you know, needs to be in court. Look, it's not about my opinion. We have a law here in Israel. And by the way, I voted against this law. And even though I voted against it, I respect it. And according to this law, a prime minister, in contrast to any other minister, can continue to serve as prime minister, uh, even with an indictment, until there is a decision ruled. And, you know, when this law was passed, the entire left and Meretz back then, uh, there were two... Uh, Arab parties, Rakach and Mada, including President Rivlin and Sipi Rivlin, the entire Labour Party, they all voted in favor of this law. I voted against it, and I warned of it back then, but it was passed, and you cannot, you know, respect only the laws that you voted for. So as far as you're concerned, it does, has nothing to do with me. There is a law. I don't like this law. I'm telling you, not only do I not like this law, I voted against it, unlike others. So when you see the Prime Minister currently, the way his managing his affairs in this past year. Do you think that a prime minister who's part of a trial, do you trust him to lead the country? I can quote the prime minister what he said about Olmert. He said that a prime minister who is so involved in, in investigations cannot publicly or ethically, morally continue to serve. Moreover, uh, there is a very reasonable option to believe that his considerations will be impacted by his personal situation and I hope that he knows the Prime Minister that you can't only talk about others you need to apply it to yourself when you're facing a similar situation thank you very much Knesset member Lieberman thank you